And I want to continue today and probably next Sunday um, finish up with the Lord's Prayer. And this is taken from uh, the Gospel of Matthew. It's a part of uh, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus speaking to the crowds that gathered and and in Luke's gospel, um, it, Jesus, the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. And this is a part of his response, but also his teaching to the crowds. And he really gives us a model prayer, a prayer that kind of shows us how we should approach God and, and pray. Not necessarily a prayer that was meant to be repeated all the time as if that was the only prayer that we knew. As I said last week, a lot of people have memorized the Lord's Prayer, and that's a good thing, and we're thankful for that. But they need to also realize there is so much more that God wants them to have conversation with them in an intimate and direct way. As Jesus said, when you pray, go into your prayer closet or into a place of secret and close the door and, and meet with your Father who knows and sees you and hears you and is waiting for you in that secret place. And he will hear your prayers and he will answer them and he will reward you openly. So as we continue with this, I want to again read it from different translations. Um, this is from the New Living Translation. Jesus says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our sins, as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. There was a really funny movie some years back that was made. It's called Bruce Almighty with Jim Carrey and Morgan Friedman. And it was a scenario where Morgan, who played God, gave Jim Carey divine godlike abilities for a short period of time in a, a limited area in the city. And the point that I wanted to make, I think Jim challenged and was very disillusioned about God, and, and that's how, partly how this all came about. And I don't want to tell you the whole story, but one of the things that God told Jim was that he was going to have to answer prayers. And so the prayers came to him through the through, uh, email, into his inbox of his email. And he thought there would be a few prayers and he could read them and answer them. And, and there were thousands and thousands of prayers. And he, he soon got very, very exhausted um, trying to read them and trying to answer these prayers. So he decided he would just do a bulk answer, yes, to everything. <laughs> and he typed it in and, and answered all, all these prayers with a yes. Well, it created total chaos because one of the number one prayers that people were praying was that they would win the lottery. And so all the lottery offices had thousands of people with winning tickets that were lining up to get their cash in their hands. And there was chaos over many other circumstances. And, and Carey, as, as he plays around with these godlike abilities, does foolish things like when he's in 
traffic and rush hour, he parts the traffic like the Red Sea, Moses, and is able to drive right down through the middle. Now, it's a humorous story, and, and it really gets at some of the issues we have in the area of prayer. The issue of what do we pray about? What do we ask God about? Can prayers be selfish and can they be um, foolish? Do we really want God to answer all our prayers? Yes, sometimes the best answer that we can get from God is no, because he knows the results of what we pray for. You see, God is concerned about our well-being. Our, more than just our temporal needs, he's concerned about our whole life. And the beauty of the Lord's Prayer is it isn't just a prayer to get something from God. It's not just, Lord, I need, I need, I need, I want, I want, I want. It's a prayer set in this beautiful acknowledgement who God is, that God is our Father in heaven and that his name should be made holy in the earth, and that his kingdom, we want his kingdom to come and his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's in this beautiful context of, of putting God first, of exalting his desires and will before our own, but it also includes our needs. It also includes what some translations say, our daily bread because we need food we need drink we need clothing we need certain things to survive in this world and God knows that he's not against that so when we think about our daily needs in the context of what Jesus is teaching and, and the fact that we aren't just going to God just to meet our own selfish desires, but we're going to him acknowledging his desires and his will, his holiness and his exaltedness. In our, he is gladly to answer our, and provide for our needs. Now that doesn't mean that every time we pray for a good parking space, we're going to get it. It does, doesn't mean that we're going to always win the lottery when we want, or we're going to gain instant wealth, or we're going to have perfect weather, or we're going to realize success and fame in this world, or we're going to have the, the neatest, newest gadget like an iPhone that we think we cannot live without. God, in this prayer, Jesus is focusing on our basic needs that is universal that all people need to survive, food, bread. I love it when Jesus, in the same sermon, talks about not worrying about what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, or what you shall wear. So he expands away from just focusing on daily bread. He expands to drink and, and what you shall wear. But he said, instead, seek God's kingdom first. And he will provide those things that you need. And that's what the Lord Prayer teaches us. First, seek God's kingdom. Seek the Father who is in heaven. Seek his will. Seek his kingdom to come as his will to be done in your life. Then ask him for your needs. And Jesus says, for life is more than food and body more than clothing. You know, when he gives these wonderful illustrations about the flowers of the field and, and the birds of the air and how God provides for them. You see, it is God's good pleasure, as he says. It's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, which includes all our needs. Maybe not all our wants, but all our needs, what we really, truly need. This prayer deals with what I would call core issues of life in the priority that they should come. The first core issue in the prayer is knowing God as our Heavenly Father. Knowing where our source is. Knowing who cares for us. Whose kingdom we want to come. 
knowing that, that God loves us and seeking his face. And then we see how we get to the place where we also can acknowledge our own individual needs for food and for the things that keep us alive in our life. This is hard to do and appreciate as much in an affluent culture, but you know, food doesn't become very important until it's not there, <laughs> until you don't have it. Now you can not have it because you choose to do some fasting, which is a wonderful way to seek God in prayer and fasting. You can ha not have it because you're in an area where there's a natural disaster and maybe here in New England it might be a snowstorm. Now just think about how we all have some kind of an insecurity about issues around food. As soon as there's a storm forecast or something's going on or a, a, a possible hurricane in the area or whatever, what happens? People rush to the grocery store. They clean it out, literally, sometimes. They have this insecurity of running out of the basic necessities of life. In fact, we are told by our government that we should have several weeks and even a month of supplies in our home, and many people do that. But Jesus is getting at the real core issue, not whether we have modern conveniences and big grocery stores with plenty of supplies which actually can empty out in a matter of days. But who are we trusting in? Who are we really trusting for our needs? Are we trusting in society? Are we trusting in the government? Are we trusting in good financial support and money and work and all those things that we think that, that enable us to have all that we need. We know that all those things can be challenged by circumstances. They all can go south when crises arise. And Jesus' message is trust in God. Trust in God. He is your Father. He is willing to give you the kingdom. He's willing to provide for your needs. Don't worry and fret about all these issues because you have a Father in heaven who is wealthy. He owns everything. He is above all things and he cares for his people. Go to him in prayer. Seek him, and you will find him. He will provide for your needs. And then as we see in, in this prayer, as we pray that he would provide for our daily needs, there's also this most important phrase it's translated different ways in different translations. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Many translations will say debts. Forgive us our debts. Some will say forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. A core issue in life is forgiveness. It is really the, the most central issue with the coming of Christ and what he was doing and what he said and what he brought into the world was forgiveness. Because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are perfect. We all need to be forgiven and we all need a second chance. We all make bad choices and succumb to temptation. We struggle with addictions. We struggle with failures in our life, moral failures, spiritual failures. We struggle with things that others have done to us and bitterness and anger. 
You know, and Jesus, he doesn't avoid those difficult subjects. He deals with, in this sermon, in the Sermon on the Mount, he deals with issues like anger and adultery and unclean thoughts and unforgiveness. He deals with all these issues that humanity struggle with from day to day. I mean, one of the greatest realization of what Jesus has done, and even in this prayer, he is pointing towards what he is going to do, is that we can be forgiven. We can be cleansed from sin. We can be set free from guilt and shame. Coming to Christ in my late teens, the thing that struck me the most was the sense of God's forgiveness. Things that I had done and failures that I had morally and spiritually, addictions that I struggled with, all those things, when I knew that Christ died for me and I believed it and I accepted him into my heart and asked for forgiveness in his name, I felt that forgiveness. I felt that love, that compassion from God that even though I didn't deserve his grace or his mercy, even though I didn't earn it, he was giving it to me unconditionally. And it was the most amazing realization and revelation and experience of my whole life up to that point. And it wasn't something that, well, that it, it came and went and the next day, business as usual, there was, there was a, a realization that there was forgiveness that God was granting all the time because of his son and what he did. You know, one of the most terrible situations to be in in this world, you know, we think of, well, it's being in poverty or, or being in a, a worn, torn area. We, you know, so we can think of many scenarios, losing our job. We can think of so many that are disastrous and difficult, but I think the worst scenario is a life without love and forgiveness. A life without kindness, it's a living hell. A life without relationships that can be healed and restored. I mean, how can people exist without it? You see, we, as we acknowledge that God is our Father, we want to become a part of the family, the family of God, His family. We want to be a part of that love that is generated throughout God himself, the Trinity, but also that we can be a part of, we can receive through faith in what he has done. So forgiveness has two dimensions, like many things. It has a vertical dimension and it has a horizontal dimension. The vertical is we seek for God to forgive us. We seek to restore and have a vital relationship with our Father who is in heaven. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses, our debts. That is the first step. That's how we learn about the second step, which is forgiving others. You'll never really fully forgive others until you receive and understand the forgiveness that God has given you through Jesus Christ. Now Jesus in this, in this message about prayer, he, he says some very difficult, challenging things. He says, forgive us our sins as we forgive others who have sinned against us. 
In Matthew 6.14, he says, If you forgive others the wrongs they have done to you, then your Father will, if you do not forgive others the wrongs they have done to you, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. So he, he says that forgiveness is dependent upon how you treat others, too. And this, you know, when I realize in my life, one of the Beatitudes is, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy is about forgiveness. It's about something that you don't deserve. It's about compassion and love that is given regardless of what you do. And I realize in my life that I need a lot of mercy. I need a lot of forgiveness a lot of patience, kindness, especially from God, but for other people too. That is, a, that is a central thing in life. So it says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So if you want mercy from God and forgiveness and kindness, be merciful to others. It will increase the mercy that you will experience from God. If you forgive others the wrongs that they have done you, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. If you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive you the wrongs you have done. You see, we need God's forgiveness. It's a, it's a core issue of life. It's a basic issue of life. We need it as much as we need daily bread. As much as we need protection. As much as we need strength to overcome temptation. We need forgiveness every day. If people don't realize this need, all they have to do is, is read Matthew 5 through 7. Just read the Sermon on the Mount. Take some time. Spend some time in it. Be honest about it. How do you, how do you measure up to what Jesus is teaching? How does your life measure up? If no other section of Scripture convicts you of sin, this sermon will convict you of sin. This sermon goes to the heart of things that people take lightly, but God takes seriously. In fact, there is a phrase in this sermon that kind of exposes everybody. Matthew 5, 48. You therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, I want to see a... How many here, raise their hands, how many here are perfect, as God is perfect? Is anybody? It doesn't say perfect like your neighbor, or perfect like your favorite movie star, or, or politician, or whatever. It's be perfect like God is perfect. That's a standard that no human being, except Jesus Christ himself, who was God, can fulfill. It's an impossibility. So why did God even ask such an outrageous thing? I think because he wanted us to see that without him, without forgiveness, without his love, without his strength and help, we can never, ever completely be what he wants us to be. We cannot be sinless now, some people may think that they're pretty perfect. They may boast about it, and they may trust in what, they, what the Bible calls their own righteousness. Jesus met people when he was walking the earth. He met people who really thought that they, were, they had it all. Sometimes they were Pharisees, sometimes Sadducees, or scribes, or elders. Or you can see the conversations throughout the gospel. They looked down on everybody else and they thought that they had it together. 
They knew what the scriptures meant. They were living a holy life. They were praying enough. They were fasting enough. They were giving to the poor. They did everything right. And here comes Jesus and exposes their hearts that they're sinners, that they're no different than anyone else, than tax collectors, than prostitutes. He exposed them. He did it through his preaching, his life, his presence. He didn't expose them in order to destroy them. He exposed them because there's only one way into the kingdom of God, and that is through the forgiveness of sins. And you cannot be forgiven of sins unless you ask, unless you believe that you are a sinner, unless you realize you need a savior. So he was giving them a lifeline to save them from their own hypocrisy, their own pride, their own arrogance, their own self-centeredness. He was handing out the possibility that even the most hardened, self-righteous religious leader of his day could come and be a part of God's great kingdom of forgiveness and love and compassion. Only if they believed who Jesus said he was, because he was the one who came preaching that salvation and forgiveness was being offered to the whole world. Of course, whenever you deal with the subject of forgiveness, and I'm just dealing with it in a very, very small way this morning, the first objection that most people have when they are told they need to forgive others is, you don't know what they did to me. And I know that what people do against each other are, is horrendous, that people have been hurt in ways that are beyond imagination. And there's always someone who has been hurt more than you. There's always someone who has been offended deeper and suffered greater than you have. It's a common condition of the world because of sin, because of Satan, because of evil that is so prevalent in this world. And we can dwell on that, but here's something to consider, as especially being in the season of Lent. Let me ask you a question. What did Jesus do wrong to deserve all that he experienced. What did he do wrong so that even his friends forsook him and betrayed him? What did he do wrong to be arrested, to be mocked, to be beaten and crucified? What crime did he commit that he would die like a criminal on a cross? Even one of his closest disciples, Judas, betrayed him. If anyone in the whole world had a reason to hold a grudge, it was Jesus Christ. He was young. He was only 33 years old. He had only been in public ministry for three and a half years. He came to his own people, the Jews, in Jerusalem and Judea. He preached the truth. He showed compassion. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He did wonderful, glorious things that no one else had ever done. He was innocent. And yet the people and the religious leaders of his day and the Romans churned against him. They crucified him. They mocked him, they beat him. When Pilate was willing to let Jesus go, he says, what shall I do with your king, the king of the Jews? And the Jewish people that were gathered said, we have no king but Caesar, crucify him. 
Even Pilate realized that he was innocent. There was nothing deserving of his death. So he was put on that cross, a brutal way to die, and he had no sin in his life. He did not have to confess his sins. He did not deserve any of that. But who really put Jesus on the cross? Was it the Romans, the Jews? No, it was all of us. We all put Christ on the cross. It was all humanity going all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden. It was sin that put him on the cross because he was bearing the sins, our sins and the sins of the world. But what did Jesus do when he was on the cross? People were cursing him. They were saying, come down from that cross, save yourself. You've saved others. Can't you save yourself? You know, that all these things were going on. And this is the most amazing thing. The one person who really could say they didn't deserve, I didn't deserve any of this. I've done nothing wrong. I'm innocent. Decided to forgive. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He could have held a grudge. He could have destroyed the world. He could have called armies of angels to stop the whole process. He could have chosen a different path. But he said, thy will be done, Father, in heaven, as it is on earth. He chose the Father's will, which was to go to the cross and to forgive and to reconcile all of humanity to himself. So if he did that for us, which the scripture abundantly shows us, how much more should we forgive others who have sinned against us? Forgive us our sins as we forgive others who have sinned against us. We do it because of what Jesus did. We do it because God gives us the power and the strength and the ability to forgive. We do it in Jesus' name. We do it through his gift of salvation that he gives us. It isn't in our own strength, but it's important. It's a necessity of life that we receive forgiveness and that we give forgiveness in his name. Amen.